from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and here's what's coming up. K-State's Stephen Graham is standing by to talk about the upcoming Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture set for this Monday here on the campus. It'll feature Jason Clay from the World Wildlife Fund. He'll be speaking on and receiving questions on the topic of feeding the world, sustaining the planet. This lecture free and open to the public, and Stephen will have the details. Then K-State's Peter Tomlinson will talk about a new guide created by K-State and Oklahoma State University on using the online information of interest to you producers provided by the National Weather Service. Further ahead with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas, then K-State's Gus Vanderhoeven. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Thanks for listening in on this Wednesday. Just a few years ago now, Kansas State University established a prestigious new lecture series entitled the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture, the latest edition of which is coming up this coming Monday right here on the K-State campus. And we brought in today the committee chairman for this lecture series and a now-retired assistant to the dean of the College of Agriculture at K-State, Stephen Graham, to preview this year's Henry C. Gardner Lecture. And before we introduce the name of the individual who will be presenting that lecture, Stephen, you might remind us of the origins of this series, and it was established to recognize and honor a longtime leader in Kansas agriculture and a very recognizable name, especially in the beef cattle industry. Yes, it's named after Henry C. Gardner, who was a leader uh, for many, many, many years and a collaborator with K-State on research. Just one of those people that's a visionary in the beef industry, founding, uh, well, continuing actually the the founding of a ranch by his great-grandfather at Ashland, Kansas. So his uh, sons wanted to uh, honor him and came to K-State in 2013 and started discussions that went through 2014 to create this new endowed lecture series. And then we kicked off the lecture series uh, early in 2015. With the overarching subject of global food systems. Now, that canvases quite some territory, but it's to be more of an outlook on the future of providing for the world. Basically. Right. You know, the family wanted to talk about food systems, uh, you know, uh, in the big, big, big picture. And they also said, we, you know, we'll want some topics over time that can be kind of controversial. And, and you know, for the, we want some discussion. We want students and others, faculty and others in the community to hear some really fascinating topics, to think about them, to realize the diversity of topics it takes to impact how we grow our food uh, here but also around the world. And, and I think we're, we're doing a great job of honoring Henry Gardner. Uh, unfortunately, he passed just before we had our first lecture, so it truly did become uh, a tribute to Henry C. Gardner. And it's been a, really a fun thing to get to know the Gardner family and to work with them and others on campus as we put together this fantastic new lecture series. And in fact, the previous presenters have very much answered the call in that respect, haven't they? Yes. The first one was uh, Dr. Robert. Robert Fraley, who is the chief technical officer for Monsanto, uh, really Dr. GMO, and uh, he had just won the World Food Prize the fall before he came and spoke early in 2015. And uh, obviously, GMOs is a very hot topic uh, and one of, you know, 
people on either side. So that was a perfect thing for our lecture series. Uh, our second lecturer was Greg Page, who at that time was in charge of all of Cargill Corporation, one of the largest privately owned corporations in the states and the world, uh, dealing with all kinds of food-related uh, things. And uh, so he was here to talk about climate change, uh, again, a very hot, hot topic. <laughs> our third speaker was Dr. Jay Famlietti, at that time a professor at the University of California at Irvine and a NASA scientist. Now he is working only with NASA. And he uh, monitors to these two big satellites that fly around the world in tandem uh, looking at aquifers, the world's largest aquifers, underground aquifers where water is stored, and telling us are the aquifers gaining in water or losing uh, and uh, as it turns out, over half of them are losing water capacity due to irrigation and other uses. Uh, and, of course, our Ogallala Aquifer in western Kansas and, and out in that region is one of them he monitors. So that was a very interesting and timely topic with the governor's whole uh, focus on you know, the aquifer and saving the aquifer. So those three previous presenters were very well received. There was were outstanding lectures unto their own. But the latest individual to serve in this capacity will be here on Monday once again. And he is with the World Wildlife Fund. Give us his story. It's a very interesting one, Stephen. Yeah, so Dr. Jason Clay um, grew up on a little farm uh, next door in Missouri. So it's exciting. He gets to come back essentially home and, and speak to people from you know his region. He's an anthropologist and uh, taught at Harvard and Yale. He's worked at USDA uh, and then for many years with the World Wildlife Fund. So really incredibly broad background. I think it's going to be really fun to listen to him. Some information on the World Wildlife Fund. It's considered, you say, one of the world's leading conservation organizations and well dispersed throughout multiple countries, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and somebody might ask, well, why is the World Wildlife Fund concerned about food being right. produced sustainably, uh, which is what the area he is. He's senior vice president for markets and food. You know, well, it's because if you're tearing down forest or uh, pasture lands or whatever so you can grow more food, then you're disturbing native wildlife you know, areas and imperiling their, their livelihoods. So uh, this is, you know, where he's coming from. Years ago, he did a little project with Ben & Jerry's ice cream to uh, see about growing Brazil nuts sustainably in the Amazon. He was successful, but he realized that wasn't going to move the needle as far as really you know, big-time food sustainability worldwide. And that's when he had kind of an aha moment and realized, oh, I'm going to have to work with the world's biggest food companies and see if we can't get them agreeing to grow you know, salmon or cotton or palm oil or beef or whatever sustainably. And so, you know, 20 so years ago, he started these roundtables, pulling together companies, focusing on a certain topic like palm oil or whatever, and working hard to get agreement of how they might do things more sustainably. And obviously, at first, uh, this was viewed uh, really askance. Uh, in some areas, it still is, really, uh, but uh, they're actually making headway. What do you anticipate will be the tone of the presentation and, moreover, the interaction mm -hmm. that goes along with this lecture? Yeah. Well, hopefully, I think the first part of it will be him just setting the stage for people to understand, especially our younger students that may not know all these things, but to understand where are we in the world population now? Where are we headed by 2050 and beyond, uh, you know, many more billions? And then what does that pose as a risk to, you know, world wildlife issues as well as just food sustainability? Then I'm hoping he moves into kind of the second part of his talk, talking about then his vision of why did he create these roundtables and who's at the tables and how do they discuss, you know, producing salmon or palm oil or cotton or whatever more sustainably? How has he been doing that? You know, we will have beef producers in the audience. Some of them are part of the U.S. Beef Roundtable that he's, you know, helped create. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping he talks about those things. And I think they have some success stories already. Some things are being produced more sustainably. And then there's still a ways to go in other areas. And, uh, you know, what's his vision for those areas and how are they going to get there? Uh, that's what I'm hoping we're going to hear. And I think we will. Stephen, you and the committee go to great pains to select individuals who will convey a contemporary and important message to all in agriculture, and it would appear very much so that you have succeeded in that cause. This is an open program. Anybody that would like to take it in, certainly welcome, free of charge, correct? Right. So next Monday, September 11th, uh, at 7 p.m. in McCain Auditorium. Please come, maybe come a little bit earlier and, and get a good seat. Uh, it's free, open to the public. You know, what we've been having at these lectures is usually 1,100 to 1,200 plus people in attendance. Also, you know, we have FFA and science classes that are listening to the, the streamed lecture um, that goes out to, over the Internet at the same time. It's live. And so we have a lot of classes listening to that. And uh, they can actually send their questions to me, sgram at ksu.edu, and then I'll read their questions. And we've had two to 500 people you know, listening to the streaming lecture, too. And then it's archived, and they can listen to that later. Anyone who can't make it to Manhattan mm -hmm. and wants to take in the program, they can watch that live stream likewise. Yes, exactly. Anybody anywhere in the world can be listening to the lecture live, yes. But if you can at all, make it to Manhattan for the lecture itself, 7 o'clock this coming Monday evening. The location, once again, is McCain Auditorium. And it ought to be a rousing evening, it would seem, Steve. I think it's going to be really fun, and I think we'll have a, a lot of great questions. And yeah. I think he'll be very pleased to be at K-State and speaking to an audience near and dear to where he grew up in Missouri, I think it's going to be a lot of fun for both us and for him coming back here to the Midwest. And it ought to be an enlightening exchange, to be sure. Good luck with the lecture as it's coming up and all the intricacies that go into that day. Stephen, thank you for the preview. You're very welcome, Eric. Thank you for letting us uh, tell a little bit about the lecture. Stephen Graham. He is the chairman of the committee for the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture Series. And the latest edition is set for this coming Monday, September the 11th, McCain Auditorium at K-State. 7 o'clock is when that lecture will be presented by Jason Clay. He is the Senior Vice President for Markets and Food at the World Wildlife Fund. He will be speaking on Feeding the World, Sustaining the Planet. Be sure to take it in if you can this coming Monday. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. We want to inform you of a product of what's called the Great Plains Grazing Project. Kansas State University, Oklahoma State University are partnered in this. And it has just generated a new publication for you agriculture producers to help you utilize further and to the maximum the weather information resources from the National Weather Service. Joining us here to explain what this is all about is Environmental Quality Specialist with the Department of Agronomy here at K-State, Peter Tomlinson. This publication is entitled Weather and Climate. Explain the initiative, if you would, here, Peter. Yeah. So as part of the Great Plains uh, Grazing Project, we want to make sure that our producers have all the tools and resources they need to manage an ever-changing environment on their farm day-to-day -day and month-to-month and -month variations that we see in, in weather. One of those resources that's out there are the forecast products available through the National Weather Service. And so we've put this publication together to uh, 
provide some instruction and guidelines on how to utilize those resources, either from your cell phone or mobile device or from your desktop computer. Both are great tools to access you know, this wealth of information and, you know, look at changing conditions on a daily basis or to plan for your operation uh, looking ahead up to seven days. For weather information is essential to producers for the day-to-day, week-to-week, season-to-season tasks ahead. Now, we might, before we talk of those two products, the mobile product and the desktop product, point out that the National Weather Service does use certain terminology and including the distinction, Peter, between the service's forecasts and its weather outlooks. You might explain that. Yes. So the forecast is that uh, short-term forecast of what is going to happen, you know, in the next few hours up to seven days. The National Weather Service also produces outlooks. They look slightly different than the forecasts, and they use different statistical models. And these look over longer time spans of, you know, month to several months, even out to six months. And so that helps with some long-range planning. But then in the day-to-day management, it's really the forecast products that we're looking at in this publication. And both are constantly updated by the service, needless to say. So they are dynamic in that respect. Let's look at the first of the two options for accessing that information. The mobile app that's out there. First of all, what's the address so folks know where to go? Yeah, so to access uh, the National Weather Service through your mobile device, you'll go to mobileweather.gov. So that's mobile.weather.gov. Just type that into your device browser, and that will bring up a uh, kind of a landing page where you can either enter the city and state or zip code and bring up the forecast for your specific area. And that forecast, you say, covers a 36-hour time window then? Yep. So, yes, that initial page that comes up does look at the weather over the next 36 hours. And then as you move through that, you have some options to select different tools that are or resources that are available, such as uh, radar and satellite, forecast discussions, different forecast graphics that are out there. You can even pull up the hourly forecast and look at what's going to happen within a given day. In fact, if you were inclined, you could look at the expected tides and the tsunami outlook, hopefully not, <laughs> not applied to Kansas. Right. The, you know, the, these tools are, are designed for the entire United States, and so there are some resources that are more applicable to Kansas. You know, one resource that ties in with another effort of K-State Research and Extension is the wind speed forecasts that the National Weather Service generates throughout the year, particularly important for those that are doing prescribed burning in the spring. And one can dig into that forecast box on the app a little deeper for that kind of specific hour-to-hour information. Correct. Then there's the desktop version. Is that more of an expanded edition of what you find on the mobile device? What, Peter? It it is. So to access it from your your home computer, it would be at uh, weather.gov. And it does provide a a bit of a different look. If you type in weather.gov, you land on a home page that has a map of the entire United States, and it will show any warnings or watches that are currently active. And you can either click on the map and start to drill down through the um, National Weather Service forecast offices, or you can, similar to the mobileweather.gov, you can type in a city, state, or zip code and get to your specific area. But it does provide, uh, the desktop version does provide a lot more detail And it's not that the detail isn't in the mobile app, but it comes up and is in front of you. (laughs) It's readily handy. Readily handy in the uh, computer version. 
you know, when you get into your specific area, you'll see a forecast for the next seven days. Allows you to, again, start to make some planning decisions. And then there's a number of other, uh, as you work through that website, uh, you can get into some interesting time series data that allows you to look at a range of different uh, weather variables uh, ranging from temperature, dew point, wind chill, heat indexes, uh, precipitation, and be able to look at what's that chance of precipitation coming, when's it expected, how much, and you know what form is it going to arrive in? Is it going to be rain or is it going to be snow? Um, based on what you select, you can overlay different variables mm-hmm really be able to tease out what's forecasted to happen. If one is, however, interested in an hour-by-hour account of weather changes, you mentioned wind, for instance, during prescribed burning, that hourly weather forecast graph can be immensely useful, can't it? It it definitely is, um, and certainly is something that through our smoke management plan that we tie directly to. Um, it's a associated product of the National Weather Service called the, uh, the Fire Forecast, and it ties in with all of this and gives specific information as it relates to burning and fire management. Very good. As you pulled this publication together, your hope here, Peter, is that those who have not fully or even at all employed the National Weather Service online tools to, in fact, do so, and this will give them some guidance uh, as to how to make the most of those resources. Yes. Many of us in research utilize these products um, for our own planning, and we recognize that there wasn't a resource out there for our producers to help guide them through how to utilize these resources from the National Weather Service. And so this publication provides some step-by-step guidance in in how to access your local uh, forecast, either from your mobile device or your desktop computer. And then we have uh, thrown in a a few fun facts along the way, Uh, one of them being, you know, what does a chance of rain really mean when you see that in a forecast? It may not be what you think. (laughs) Exactly. As we discuss in this publication, the likelihood of measurable precipitation, and it only has to be one hundredth of an inch of rain at a location during a specific time period that could be from three to 12 hours. Mm. So really that chance of rain is, is the probability of precipitation So when you hear that there's a 40% chance of rain, there only has to be one hundredth of an inch of rain for that 40% probability to be true. It could be 100% chance of rain and only only one one hundredth of an inch. Correct. Or it could be that there's a 20% probability and you get a one-inch precipitation event. Or a deluge, perhaps. Right. Yeah. And that's interesting information included on the front page of this publication. Then it gets into the nuts and bolts of the app, how it works, as well as the desktop version of the website. And for this publication itself, where might one go? So this publication can be accessed both through Kansas State University and Oklahoma State. For K-State, it can be accessed through the K-State Research and Extension Bookstore. And it can also be accessed through the Great Plains Grazing Project website at greatplainsgrazing.org. This is helpful information, Peter. You contributed to pulling it together, so thanks to you and your team for doing just that. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Environmental Quality Specialist, K-State's Department of Agronomy. That's Peter Tomlinson. Again, it's called Weather and Climate, National Weather Service Forecasts Serving Agriculture, a publication which can lend very simple and straightforward guidance on making the most out of the resources available from the National Weather Service producers. Agriculture Today will return in a moment. This is the K-State Radio Network. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. 
This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you as we catch up on the day's agricultural news headlines now, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, the Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report for this week is now out from the USDA one day later than normal because of the Labor Day holiday. For the week ending this past Sunday, topsoil moisture supplies in Kansas are now at 38%, short to very short, 60% adequate, and 2% surplus. Subsoil moisture is at 34%, short to very short now, 65% adequate, and 1% surplus. Winter wheat planting in Kansas was... 1% done, that's equal to the average for the date. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 54%, good to excellent, 30% fair, and 16% poor to very poor. Corn in the dough stage, 93%, in the dent at 75%, and corn now reaching maturity at 30%. The harvest, 3% complete. Soybean crop condition in Kansas, 11% poor to very poor, 35% fair, and 54% good to excellent. Soybeans setting pods now at 94% and dropping leaves at 8%. And the condition of the Kansas grain sorghum crop is at 58% good to excellent, 33% fair, and 9% poor to very poor. Sorghum headed is now at 95% and sorghum coloring at 46%. Sorghum having reached maturity is now at 5%. Fourth cutting of alfalfa is 59% complete, ahead of the average for the date. Nationally, the USDA estimates that 92% of corn has reached the dough stage as of this past weekend, 60% of the crop is dented, and 12% of corn is considered mature now. The corn crop condition nationally dropping slightly from 62% good to excellent last week to 61% in this week's report. The USDA estimating 97% of the soybeans have now set pods, and 11% are dropping leaves now. 61% of the soybean crop in good to excellent condition, the same as the previous week, according to the USDA. And grain sorghum nationally, 62% coloring, and 31% now mature. The sorghum harvest is 23% in. Sorghum crop condition dropping to 60 63% good to excellent from 65% in last week's USDA report. Well, the main headliner here in Kansas today, Tyson Foods, announced it will plan to build a $320 million poultry complex near Tonganoxie in northeast Kansas. In addition to creating 1,600 jobs, Tyson will be contracting with producers to provide the needed poultry supplies to the operation. According to a news release from the company, the operation would begin production in mid-2019. Tyson is expected to produce prepackaged trays of fresh chicken for retail grocery stores across the country. The plant will have the capacity to process about one and a quarter million birds per week, according to the Tyson news release. The new operation is expected to generate an annual economic benefit to the state of Kansas of $150 million, according to the company. Tyson's new plant will also include a hatchery and a feed mill. Now, Tyson said in the news release that it intends to buy about 300 acres of land south of Tonganoxie and currently plans to break ground sometime this fall. Farmers and ranchers who have interest in raising chickens for the new plant can find information at growwithtyson.com. Tyson Foods announced earlier this year it was moving to a no-antibiotics policy with its branded retail chicken products and said yesterday that the Kansas plant will be part of that effort. There's been a great deal of discussion lately about how antibiotics are used in raising livestock. Todd Domer reports here that ranchers take antibiotic use very seriously by following accepted practices set forth in a national program. For nearly 30 years, there have been quality assurance programs in place to ensure ranchers and feeders continuously are improving the way they raise beef, including how antibiotics are used. The goal of producers to protect both human health and animal health is known as antibiotic stewardship. 
A foundation for this stewardship in the beef community is the Chekhov-funded Beef Quality Assurance Program. BQA is a nationally coordinated, voluntary program that provides guidelines for raising beef. It is guided by an advisory board including veterinarians, animal scientists, meat scientists, ranchers, and dairy farmers from across the country. One of the guidelines for beef producers addresses the judicious use of antimicrobials in cattle. There are 14 use guidelines including to avoid using antibiotics that are important in human medicine, use a narrow spectrum antimicrobial, treat the fewest number of animals possible, and the use of antibiotics should be limited to treatment, prevention, or controlling disease. The BQA program teaches that antibiotics are just one tool to ensuring healthy animals with good management practices, vaccines, cattle nutrition programs, veterinary care, and low-stress handling, among others. Beef quality assurance influences management practices used on more than 90% of all U.S. cattle. The industry regularly conducts training and education sessions designed to increase the number of producers who are BQA certified. I'm Todd Domer. In other headlines today, U.S., Canadian, and Mexican trade negotiations hope to continue progress on the North American Free Trade Agreement going into the third round of talks later this month. More on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. Round two of North American Free Trade Agreement renegotiations is in the books, concluding Tuesday in Mexico City. I am pleased to report that we have found mutual agreement on many important issues. That's U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, joined by counterparts from Mexico and Canada at the second round closing press conference. By the end of this round, we will have tabled over two dozen chapters, and I look forward to continued progress in round three and the ones that follow. The next round of NAFTA renegotiations takes place later this month in Canada's capital city of Ottawa. And as Mexico's Secretary of the Economy, Ildefonso Guajardo Villarreal, closed the event, he told reporters that Mexican, Canadian and U.S. officials have instructed our CN's chief negotiators to really engage in the following weeks in a way in which the momentum of this process can be presented in the third round. A broad Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And lastly in the headlines today, on the final day of the public comment period for the Renewable Fuel Standard, a number of agriculture and biofuel interest groups called on the Environmental Protection Agency to set the bar higher for cellulosic ethanol. In comments sent to the EPA, at least three of those groups called out the agency for originally proposing an increase in the cellulosic number, only to cut the number in a span of nine days back in June during an interagency review. This is Agriculture Today, and we'll be back with more in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever wondered why livestock producers burn Kansas pasture? Here's the deal. Controlled burning helps preserve the prairie and allows every bite feeder cattle eat to be the most nutritious. National Wildlife and Parks also feel it is a necessity to help with wildlife populations. So the next time you see a Kansas pasture burning, know it's for the good of our wildlife, our prairie, and our livestock. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. Back in 1932, in the midst of the Great Depression... This song swept our country. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. This past Monday was Labor Day. I did not watch any parades, nor did I labor. I did Google and learned that the Labor Day holiday was celebrated in New York City on September 5, 1882, for the first time. In 1884, the first Monday of September was selected for this working men holiday. And that is what it has been ever since. The first Monday in September is Labor Day. It's a long weekend, and I saw one sailboat and several motorboats pulling people 
on water skis on the lake. It was a great weekend to be on the water. On Sunday morning, Anneke read a brief story written by Edward Hayes. The booklet, A Pilgrim's Almanac, has a brief story each day of the year. And to be honest, I really did not have the patience or wanted to listen to a story. But she was determined that I would, and she started to read. You will like this, she said. The story, a Labor Day story, did indeed interest me as part of the story she read, the song, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? I've heard and listened to that song. It's on record of Bing Crosby. But back in 1932, in the midst of the Great Depression, this song swept our country. And listening to the words, I thought of the people who labored to build this country. People who built the factories, the roads, the bridges, and the railroads, driving the spikes with heavy hammers, singing to keep the rhythm. Farmers who plowed the land and built the ranches. When you think of how they labored to build with dreams and hope, And then the crash? Brother, can you spare a dime? They used to tell me I was building a dream, and so I followed the mob. When there was earth to plow or guns to bear, I was always there, right on the job. They used to tell me I was building a dream, with peace and glory ahead. Why should I be standing in line just waiting for bread. Once I built a railroad, I made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once I built a tower up to the sun, brick and rivet and lime. Once I built a tower, now it's done. Brother, Can you spare a dime? Once in khaki suits, gee, we look swell, full of the janky doodle dum. Half a million boots went slogging through hell, and I was the kid with the drum. Say, don't you remember they called me L? It was L all the time. Why, don't you? There were people who built Brutus, the huge coal shovel. Those were the people who could operate Brutus in the southeast Kansas, in Cherokee County, where coal was dug and land was scraped. Edward Hayes, who wrote the small story and reflected on the song, was the brother of Sister Hayes. And Sister Hayes managed the grounds of St. Mary's College in Leavenworth. She had a great personality, and I often worked with her solving problems on the grounds. If she is still living, she would be very old now. Sister Jane reminded me always of an aunt I had known as Sister Bea. She rode a bike, later a small scooter, through her district to assist with birth and death, to heal and comfort when she could, through all kinds of Dutch weather, rain, sleet, snow, and ice. They were all pioneer women, tough, even in the old country. Talking about the old times, a friend, an anthropologist, sent me a short story from Maine. Kansas was still Buffalo country then. It was 1747. But in 1747, on June 21, a message was received from Montreal that a war party of the Mohawks had made another attack on the upper end of the Isle of Montreal. Women were taken. Immediately a detachment of 100 men was sent in pursuit. They caught up with the Indians but captured only one canoe with six occupants, 
four Seneca, one Oneida, and the sixth was a Dutchman who was dressed as an Indian, even wearing a scalp lock. There's more to the story, but that was 1747, June. Just think back to what this country was like then. It still had to be built. And who was the Dutchman? No wonder they're American Indians with blue eyes. All stories. Pick your date and place. 1747, 1932, 1917. That's 270 years of labor to build and rebuild this country. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. That'll do it for our Wednesday edition, reminding you once more if you'd like to hear a replay of any and all of our features here on the broadcast, it's all archived on our website, ksre.ksu.edu slash news. You'll also find a full podcast of each day's program right there, KSRE. Dot ksu.edu slash news. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.